Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. My guest today is named Claire. She's a friend of mine who is, I guess, currently calling the Bahamas home. Well, at least that is where her catamaran is currently parked. And she walks us through how she and her husband made the transition from a quote unquote normal life with a home and cars and careers and all of that to living on a catamaran and exploring the Caribbean islands. So it was absolutely fascinating. I've been loving following their journey on social media and seeing the pictures they post. And I was really interested to hear the backstory, how this came to be and how they traded in this one life for a very adventurous life. And it's absolutely fascinating to uh, to hear how they've done that. So I really enjoyed this one. I hope you will as well. There were unfortunately some serious sound issues. Uh, we were connecting from a boat out in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. So bear with us on that, but I hope you enjoy nonetheless. It was a lot of fun. Let's go sailing with Claire. Please help me in welcoming her to About Abroad. Claire, welcome to About Abroad. It's been forever. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I was, I was just thinking before we were getting started on this, I was like, all right, let me think back to where we first met. And uh, I'm pretty sure the first time we met, we were running across the state of Florida from Miami to uh, to Key West. Is that right? Yeah, I had the same idea yesterday. I was like, wait, we did that race together. I, <laughs> I actually forgot for a minute. But yes, that was quite the introduction. I guess we yeah. could say. Um, yeah. we, <laughs> we did. Yeah. For for a little bit of context for people listening, uh, we we're we we have mutual friends and we're sort of like social media friends, I guess. We follow each other and uh and enjoy living vicariously through each other's uh different lives. But we originally met on a Ragnar. Is it is it called a Ragnar, right? Yeah. 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 I was like, I was double checking myself there. Like, that's the name of the character in the Vikings and stuff. But yeah, Ragnar race, basically, <laughs> like, I don't even remember how many miles it was, but it's some like, it's like a multi day race was, from one city to the next. Yeah. That one was like right around 200. Yeah. And, okay. <laughs> you know, we had our, our team and our vans and we caravaned and switched off and ran our different legs. It was super so. fun. Yeah, a couple it days awesome. running yeah. across, uh, running through the swamps and the Everglades and stuff, and then eventually arriving to beautiful Key West for a, for a good time. So you guys kind of have the islands in your blood. Where where are you guys right now? By the I have no idea. So we're in the Bahamas. We're in Eleuthera, Spanish Wells, Eleuthera. Which honestly, before we started traveling, I just thought of the Bahamas as the Bahamas. I didn't really know Eleuthera was an island in the Bahamas, but yeah, it's kind of like the Bahamas are split up. I'd say mainly there's NASA. And then there's the Abacos, Eleuthera, and then the Exumas. And of course, there's out islands along the way, but those are kind of the main group. Okay. So we crossed over to the Abacos, and then we went through the Abacos, and now we crossed to Eleuthera. So we're in uh, right outside Spanish Wells. Okay. We got, yeah. we have so much to dive into. Cause I like, <laughs> like I, sometimes when I bring people on the show, I actually know a decent amount about the kind of backstory, but with you guys, what I think is interesting is that I really don't know anything except I just keep seeing these amazing pictures of you guys doing like really fun workouts on your awesome boat in the middle of some beautiful <laughs> islandy paradise. And I'm like, what are they doing? And so eventually I just was like, Hey guys, I, I got to know more about this. And I think people that listen to about abroad might as well. So Let's 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 like back up a little bit and uh, and give some context. Tell tell the audience a little bit about like generally speaking what you're doing, and then I think we'll we'll even back up a little further and tell people how you got there. Okay. In general, we are living and cruising on our catamaran, and it's a 37 foot catamaran. And right now, kind of plan is this is our second year, but our kind of plan is to cruise for three months maybe longer and then head back home and try to work and you know restock the bank account and such and yeah and it's an ever-changing plan but currently that's that's what we're doing cool okay and so uh, so the idea is nine months real life three months the life yes basically yeah um and 
three months, three months just kind of came about because you can do in the Bahamas specifically, you can get uh, your travel permit can do three months, six months or a year. And so we just picked three months just to kind of start. But um, obviously, we'd like to forget the real life part and just do this <laughs> more. But uh, this has been a good, good place to start for now. Very cool. So you do need like a you need like a travel permit to sail around the Bahamas? Yes, the cruising permit, and it's based on the size of your boat and how long you're going to be here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then we have a dog, so you have to get the dog. Interesting. But side note, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think it's a kind of a, a core part of the deal here because that's something like yeah. I literally would never. I would think like, all right, well, yeah, if you want to, I mean, obviously to like port, I guess, and to like go into the city, like go into the towns and stuff. But I mean, I I guess it, like you're not. I mean, it seems like you guys are out at sea a, a decent amount, or at least like you know anchored. I'm going to use all the wrong terminology in this conversation, <laughs> and you're going to think I'm an idiot. Anchored, uh, so correct anchored, me where yeah. I'm wrong. <laughs> anchored is correct. Yes, we prefer to anchor. We, I definitely agree with what you're saying. If you're going into the marinas more and um, using onshore facilities more, the permit is a lot more important. But we prefer to anchor out. We rarely, I mean, if anything, we would pick up a mooring ball, which is basically just any. Anything on the ground that has a big rope tied to it that you can attach your boat to. So it's, it's not going to ruin, like, say, the coral reef um, because people are throwing their anchors in it as much. And they might be in more protected areas that somebody manages these mooring balls. So we would much rather pick up a mooring ball if the weather is bad. But honestly, we, we rarely we just anchor and watch the weather and try to hide behind islands and stuff like that when the wind gets strong. So <laughs> I, uh, I want to ask a question about that, but I, I've just real quick, want to finish the the yeah. permit thing for anybody that's you know eventually going to listen to this and be like, yeah, I want to live the Claire and Jonathan life too. What's the what's the permit process like? It, it, like relatively speaking, is it is it a long arduous process that's super expensive or like quick and easy and cost ten bucks? They vary. It so it's definitely changed a little bit with the COVID situation, but I'd say there's kind of two parts. There's the cruising permit part, which used to be last year, for example, they've definitely made some changes and they're trying to put it more online and streamline it a little bit better. Um, but the cruising permit part, like I was saying, it's just paperwork. You know, you have to fill out stuff about your boat, who's on it, the passenger, the crew. Um, if you have dogs, if you have weapons on board, if you, you know, like we have a dinghy, which is basically like our car, just so they know what you're bringing into the country and how long you're going to be here. So for us, based on a 37 foot boat, ours for three months is $300. I think 30, I'm pretty sure it's 34 and under. It's only 150 for three months. So, you know, and I think there's 150 and over. There's a one more tier. Um, so not like super expensive by any means, but we learned from some friends that if you do plan on staying, if you think you might stay for six months, it's best to just go ahead and do six months. It's kind of, they said it was a pain to add months on. So they said that kind of, that, that was a learning curve for them last year. Um, so they passed that information along. So it's the cruising permit. So last year was a bunch of paperwork. Um, when you get into port, you raise your yellow quarantine flag, basically saying we are not checked in yet. We, technically, you can't get off your boat other than the captain is supposed to go to shore and check in. So you bring all your paperwork, your passports and everything, and you go to shore to the, clear, the customs office and um, get clear. And now this year they did a new system called Quick to Clear and it's just more online. It was pretty good. It it definitely has some glitches still. Um, but I think the idea that they're trying to go a little bit more virtual is a good one, especially because I think uh, COVID put a lot of stress on everybody and we're quite prepared to ha need more people to also like implement new new things and new programs. So um, so that's one part of it, uh, the cruising permit. And then the other part now, the big thing is the health visa. Um, and that's a whole nother process. It's not really hard. It's just uh, making sure that you're, you know, doing things, you know, for example, within 72 hours, you have to get tested, you have to submit it and give them another 24 hours to accept it. Um, so it's just, you know, going through the motions. But um, I do think, you know, once we did it last year, this year it was a lot more straightforward. Yeah. That was, that's the other like half, I'd say. Cool. 
that, that's yeah that's all good to know like if you actually want to do this it, it's interesting when you fly somewhere like you're going to land in an airport you're going to go if you're changing countries you're going to go through customs and like there's no obscurity there you just cross you've just crossed into another border but like the bahamas are like you're talking about international waters and you're you're kind of in like i could see how it would be easy to just kind of like float around out there and and uh, you would think you know off the top of your head yeah. i mean if you know, there's yeah. probably lots of islands. There's lots of like uninhabited or or just very lowly habited. Like you don't have to pull up to ports and be in cities. So it's a little bit more obscure than the the average person just changing countries and needing to have a visa or not have a visa. It's It's got some opaqueness to it. Yeah. And um, it's not like people are going to be stopping you out here on the water and checking to make sure you have all these documents. You know, the like I was saying, if you go into the marinas, they do ask. But like in where we are, we've honestly never been asked to present any documentation of any sort. Um, you know, we're following the rules, but it is definitely kind of, it's, it's pretty whatever. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I mean, we're doing what we're supposed to, but it isn't, they're not going to come hunt you down. They no. don't like come do tests at your boat or anything like that. Um, so yeah. And even like with the dog permit, that was that you, it's good to know that it takes like five months. They're saying total, like if you just mail them the piece of paper, it's going to take them like six to eight weeks to get it. And then it could take a month for them to process it. And so anyways, you know, they're like, Hey, the $60 and expedite UPS this piece of paper to them like they will fax it back to you if you pay five more dollars but they don't email it back to you so you <laughs> really have to think ahead on that one because you won't get it back if you don't really really plan for it so um but you know formalities <laughs> you know what's really funny is you know anybody that listens to this show has heard me say before like we travel we, we've traveled a lot with our dog who's like a 50 pound husky and you know it's not like i say that because it's not like a little lap dog that you can just carry around on a plane like it's a process you have to he has to fly in the cargo hold like you have to register him as cargo to fly around and so it's a huge pain to to move him around the world and we've been stupid enough to try to do that many times and anyway one of the times we decided like we're not we don't feel like going through that again we had just done it three months prior and we were like we're not doing that again instead we're going to drive to the north of europe and uh, take a ferry like, oh, it'll be easier on a boat. Uh, we'll take a ferry across. <laughs> We're, we needed to get to Ireland. And so we did all that. And like the fer it was just like, I, I guess I'm connecting the dots because it's like, you know, you're all you'd think you part of you would think with you, it's like, oh, right, you just get on your boat and you go with your dog and you arrive at an island. And but you're like, no, you have to do all this paperwork. And, and it was the same thing for us. Like we like got to this ferry port, had to do all this paperwork, actually ran into a huge <laughs> problem with our paperwork in France. And we ended up barely getting through and then we were on a 24 hour overnight really choppy uh ferry ride and like we had to put him in like a terrible crate situation in the bottom of the boat and uh, it ended up being like we could have just flown here for like an hour and, a, and like an hour and a half and just been done with it <laughs> and instead right, we right. did all this uh this work so anyway traveling with a dog is not always super easy <laughs> Yeah. Moral of the story. I will say though, our our dog is very portable. He is a whopping nine, maybe ten pounds, probably nine. Yeah. So I will say on on that on that note, he's pretty easy to to move around. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen some hilarious yeah, videos of him like out on these islands. You guys are on just like like running circles out on the beach and play. I mean, he looks like he's thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. I um, I always say to Jonathan, I'm like, you know, he didn't know when we adopted him that he was going to be a boat dog. Well, I don't think we knew at that point either because we've had him for like maybe maybe three and a half years. So maybe we didn't know either. But he didn't know he was going to be a boat dog. But he's adjusted very well. Um, but his favorite part is definitely the beaches. He one day, one day he's going to fall off that dinghy. He'll ride on the very very current, like captaining <laughs> the ship, and leap off full bore. So, but yeah, we, we will have <laughs> links to your social media handles and stuff in the show notes for this. Um, and, and we'll, we'll call all that out later, but if, for anybody that's listening and like wants to see videos and pictures of that, it, it is super cute <laughs> and, uh, well, well worth a look. So, um, yeah, go, go follow. Uh, so, uh, okay. So I've digressed a little while back and wanted to get back <laughs> to this kind of, cause I'm super interested in like how you guys arrived to this moment from the time when we ran to Key West to now a lot has changed. And, uh, yeah. and so you guys are living this boat life three months out of the year what the, the other nine months like are you guys 
totally disconnected from work during these three months? Or are you are you working while you're out there and then attached to that? Like when you go back, what is that transition like back to kind of like the real world? Okay. Um, so when we did our run, we were on the, we're going to get married and buy a house mode. And then we did, we got married and we bought a house and mid remodel. We were like, why did we buy a house? We're never at our house, literally never between races. And just, we would go on weekend getaways and go hiking. You know, why would we just stay home? So we came up with this idea that we're going to finish remodeling it and sell it and buy a boat. So that's what we did. Jonathan was constantly looking at boats online. And I was kind of on the, well, if we're going to look, if you're going to spend all this time looking at them, like, let's just do it. Like, let's not just talk about it. Let's actually like, do this. So we did. Yeah, it took probably like a year and a half, I'd say, from when we kind of decided to actually get the boat. And I mean, that alone is a whole nother story, but all in all, it went well. And so, yeah, we're pretty much when we leave. So this is the second year we've been at. So last year, we free planned and we told our current jobs. So I was doing physical therapy for a couple of companies and and the heating technician. Um, so very hands-on jobs, not virtual whatsoever, unfortunately. But we just told them, you know, hey, we're planning on leaving in January. We tried to leave on good news. We're going to them. We're going to be back in April ish. We didn't have an exact day, and you know, they said okay. So we totally connected and we left. And we just, I guess, our mindset last year was just figure this out. We tailored, and yeah, a house and a boat are not same thing so we had to kind of relearn all the systems how the toilets work the water tank it's kind of like glorified camping you know fill your water tank it's been uh yeah it's a huge learning curve here we just kind of left and uh, we had taken a sailing school so we sort of knew what we were doing and yeah and so we just came out and we traveled kind of the same route we're doing this year and then when we got back that was rough um, reality happened. So our plan was to go back to Hilton Head area and just kind of pick up our jobs. We had companies and they both were like, yep, we need you. Um, it's going to be summer. We're busy. You know. So as far as jobs went, it worked out kind of as we hoped and just kind of picked up working again. Jonathan got busy really fast me a little bit because I um, am PRN. So I had to build my work caseload back up. But um, in general, yeah, we we plan to just kind of hit it hard and the boat sort of on the back burner. So yeah, we had, we still had a car we needed to sell and some other like stuff from when we sold our house we needed to take care of. So yeah, the transition home was not great, but you know, we went on a three month vacation basically. So yeah, um, kind of to be expected. I can, I could totally relate to this. I know that feeling. It's not super fun to, to retransition. Uh, what did you no. get? What did you guys do about like, like things like the cars and stuff and uh, like a home, like you rent a place on kind of a nine month contract or what do you, what's, what's that situation like? Okay. Pretty much in my mind, when we were buying this boat, I was thinking, okay, we have to somehow move all of our stuff from our house onto a boat, you know, so the boat has to be huge in my mind originally. And we ended up getting a smaller boat than we originally planned on, but I am cannot say enough how much, how happy I am that we ended up with the boat that we have, because it's not too big for us. It's not. So my original plan was we have to move all of our stuff into this boat. But then uh, we discussed getting a storage unit because the reality was we have a lot of good stuff and we can't just sell it all. So um, <laughs> we discussed the storage unit, but all in all, it ended up being my parents. Um, I guess, and we kind of just thankfully relied a little bit on their their space at their house and we store it. We had our two cars and we kept them there. And my dad actually really liked one of them. So he was driving it a lot, which was, I was like, perfect. And so we put like our, you know, stuff at their house and they have a shed. So we just kind of used that. And, um, but yeah, we definitely still had a bunch of stuff we needed to like get rid of from our so Yeah. So thank, thank goodness for the parents. They were huge, huge, huge help and so appreciative of them all. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's necessary. Like you start transitioning into these like alternative sort of lifestyles that uh, like like for especially if you're going. I think it's I think it's good to talk about these things because there's a lot of people in the same boat like that are listening. Uh, same boat, not not pun intended. There, just like <laughs> there's making that 
first step is like, oh, those are the things you think about. What do I do with all my stuff? I have cars. I'm going to, I don't know if I want to do this forever. Should I sell everything? So like you think about these things and I did the exact same thing. We stored all my stuff uh, at my parents' house and we sold a lot of it. We, you know, we sold our house, we sold our cars. So we we got rid of stuff, but there were like, you know, things that we didn't want to get rid of. And and so those went in my parents' garage and yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not like that. That's a great way to transition. And like through the years we've done different things, but anyway, it's worth asking those those kind of questions because I think a lot of people that are listening and you're sort of trying to make that transition themselves and unsure where to start and what's okay and what's not. And it's like, yeah, lean on the people around you to to help make this, you know, possible. Yeah, I I was very much in it first to lean on my family. I felt like it was time to, you know, we could do it ourselves. Like I felt like we needed to handle it. You know, if we really wanted to live this lifestyle, we were gonna have to deal with all this other stuff that we didn't want. I did slowly come to terms with the fact that they want to help, like they support, you, they are okay with helping if they can. And so I did have to like make that an and it took me a little bit. I, but yeah, it, it all works out and you do realize, you know, as you go through it, that it's a, that's okay. So yeah, yeah. So, um, you go and then you go every time we go back, it's like, okay, so this time I think we need to maybe go through this stuff again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You end up reaming like every, every year you like keep getting rid of more and more stuff. And then you're like, wow, we really yeah. have this is all my life is, is these four boxes. That's very, that's very interesting to hear. And I think it's, I think it's really cool. And one of the things that just also just worked out is like the point about the jobs, like you, you guys took a risk, you took that leap of faith. And then you're hoping that when you get back, you know, there'll be something there for you. And and in retrospect, I always think it's like, of course it was like, you didn't lose all those years of training and skills and everything. But when you're at that point of jumping and taking that leap, it seems like, oh my God, I hope there'll be, I know, I hope I'll be able to find a job. And it's like, in the end, Mm -hmm. they are just jobs. And usually you're going to find them, find something again. So I haven't met many people that took that leap and were when they returned, like weren't able to find something. They didn't, they didn't set themselves back 20 years by going away for three months. It just, it just doesn't work like that. Right. Yeah, I know. But it is scary because you, you want to be like financially responsible and you don't want to make, you know, what in your mind decisions and, you want to you know, think you planned for all of the potential things that could happen. But um, yeah, it, it did all work out. And you're right. It's just, I agree. It's just a job. And I've always said jobs can be temp- just be temporary. You know, like yeah. it doesn't have to be like this new job you got has to be your, your job for 20 years. Yeah. It, this is this is know. a big cha- change of mindset that like we probably all have a lot of people. I mean, you and I are both from the U.S. and it's not just a U.S. thing, but for sure in the U.S. it's very much so like a career driven society. Like we're like, okay, like get your career, you buy your house, you live in that house. It's a <laughs> great investment. You get it as soon as possible. You pay it off as quickly as possible. Uh, maybe then you buy a second house and like you know this. It's like yes. it's all yes. like career yes. and home mindset. Uh-huh. And you've kind of like bucked all that and been like, okay, so we're gonna buy like a a boat which yeah, I know that's a depreciating <laughs> asset, but like it seems yeah. fun to spend three months a year on that and not at my house. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, we're just going to do yeah. that. And oh yeah, by the way, I'm also going to quit my job. Like when, when you say yeah. it out loud, yeah. you're like, this goes against every thing that I've ever been told. But <laughs> then you kind of think right. like, well, why? Because this is awesome. I don't spend that much time at my house anyway. That's what in Spain, what's really interesting is like people don't spend time in their house. So they care very little about their house. Like People that make really good money or live really great lives, they like may not have a super nice house. They're just like a little apartment. It's just a place to sleep. And they often say, like, yeah, we live in like exactly. we live in the street, you know? And so they're like, we vivimos in la calle. They're like, we live in the street. We're just out. We do stuff outside. We go eat outside. We hang out with friends outside. We go to yeah. the park. We go to the beach. Um, and so I've all that's kind of like resonated with me. Like we yeah. put a lot of emphasis on the house in the US. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I so I I tried to make a website. Well, I did make a website. Uh, recently, I've never made one. But literally, on um, the little part that's about us, it says, you know, wh- why would we have a house? We ne- were never at our Like, why would you, why would we have this? And so the whole concept behind this boat was now we can take our house with us. And I wrote about how we love to travel and go on vacations, but we hate paying for places to stay because literally all we do is sleep there. Like, yes, I want the bed to be sort of comfy, but I'm only sleeping there. So now we can just move this house around. I mean, we don't really spend that much time on it either, but at least we aren't paying extra money to just sleep in a bed somewhere when really we want to be out doing something. So yes, totally agree with all of that. I love (laughs) that you guys have, have done that. 
We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This season is brought to you by my good friends over at Insured Nomads. They're the absolute best in the business when it comes to providing health, travel, and medical insurance for nomads, expats, and really just all forms of world travelers. I know insurance is often something that's overlooked when we're fantasizing about traveling the world, but it's absolutely necessity that we address this because often the policy you have in your home country isn't going to cover you while you're abroad. And it's also a requirement, as a lot of people may not realize, to actually buy private travel or expat insurance, as it's called sometimes, to obtain a visa or even enter certain countries. So fortunately, there are companies like Insured Nomads to help us with this. Not only do they have excellent coverage and great prices, but they're also providing a first-class experience with additional perks and best-in-class technology via their app. It's a it's an amazing experience. I can't recommend it enough. Now, this is a company that was built by world travelers for world travelers. So they know what it's like to find yourself in a difficult medical situation abroad, and they want to keep you from having that same bad experience. So the next time you're planning a trip abroad, whether it's for a week or a lifetime, check out Insured Nomads via the link in the show notes. Okay, now back to the episode. Okay, so we got through like kind of the backstory and the and some logistics, yeah. and now it's time to like spend some time in the Bahamas. I think like okay. in in our minds because you guys are like the the videos and the pictures that I see the the color of the water, the islands, the sand, the snorkeling that you all do. You guys are like catching lobsters with your bare hands. I mean, yeah. it looks <laughs> so idyllic. And so I don't I don't even know what my question is. I just want to hear more about like your day to day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad you're keeping us on track here because there's so much, you know, in the big picture. So, so the Bahamas are awesome. You know, prior to coming here, I thought I needed to go to the Virgin Islands to see awesome water and, you know, go to the Caribbean. But the Bahamas are awesome. They have the water is beautiful. The Exumas are definitely worth going to what everybody says. It's the bluest, clearest water. And it's so true. What What are the it Exumas is, versus the Bahamas? I actually have no okay, idea. So, okay. So the Bahamas, let's, this kind of goes back to the very beginning. Uh, the Bahamas have kind of three island groups and then Nassau. So there's Nassau, the Abacos. The Abacos, that's where the hurricane hit really hard a couple of years ago. And then there's the Luther, which is where we are now. And then further south, there's the Exumas. And the Exumas are definitely a little bit more out islands. Like there's one major airport at the in Georgetown, which is the southernmost island. But other than that, there are a lot of just islands um, with some small towns, but nothing nothing much really very small grocery stores and some of them yeah some of them uh, most of them if they have water you pay for them it's more the remote areas compared to uh, the avocados in Olympia. but it has the best water for sure and the best snorkeling um it's the best they have the exhumas land and sea park which has some really beautiful reefs there um we started spear fishing when we came here so you can't have, you can only use a spear fit, uh, you can't use a spear gun. So they want to make, it, um, we've been doing a lot of spear fishing, but you cannot hunt in the land sea part. Um, that's just a protected area in the Exumas. But yeah, it has probably the best lane for sure. The coral is, is the prettiest. And are, are they very, are they very far apart? Like, like, are they, all, are these all islands map, all clustered like together? <laughs> yeah, we do. But I mean, so, just, just in. In general, like, are you like sailing back and forth between them, or can is it hard to tell when you're in one place or the other? Except you know, um, yeah. So, so the Abacos is a grouping, so you can get from one to the other in like an hour on a slow, you know, close. Aletha, same thing. Aletha is one big island, so we can kind of our plan is to kind of hop down the coast of Aletha. Um, you can also drive it. So, for example, I think you could drive Aletha in maybe two hours, but we'll hop down the coast and we'll do stops in different bays and towns, and we just base that on if there's something specific we wanted to see. So here there's like a blue hole, a sapphire blue hole, which is, I forget how deep it is, but it's just a huge whole body of water that they've said that we can jump in and they have um, a cave here. Like a cave system. It's about a mile long, but it's totally under, underground and you threw it. So that's cool. They've got, last year we went to this pond that it has seahorses because whatever the it's some sort of brackish water and it's the depth, but the seahorses really like the pond. Um, so we stopped this specific area to get off the pond to snorkel it to see the seahorses. Um, wow. So, yeah, so we basically just move our boat around to go see certain things or go to the land and sea park or 
go dive up there or go on a hike. There's like an abandoned naval base somewhere. Um, so we'll just like anchor out and go hike around that and, you know, explore. And <laughs> yeah, we just uh, stay as active as possible pretty much. We, uh, it's funny because if I try to write a journal every day, well, I keep track of like what we do. And some days I'm like, writing it and thinking oh my gosh that was just this morning like we've done so much we've already taken the dog to the beach tried to do some sort of little workout come back ate breakfast then we went snorkeling the plane wreck then we come back oh let's go hike because we heard there's this abandoned whatever over here so there we're off trekking through the woods finding this abandoned something and yeah so then we document all those fun activities for <laughs> but yeah so the island the bahamas uh i don't know what i don't what I was telling you about really, but well, how it's a lot. I was, and then, yeah. And then, yeah. so, and then I'd say between the big chains of islands, it's like a eight to 10 hour sail for us. So like when we leave a Luther and go to the Exumas, it will plan around the weather and it'll take us like 10 hours to get to the Exumas. And once we're in the Exumas, there's technically 365 islands in the Exumas. So we can, we can just kind of bounce around there. And it's awesome because you can find, you know, just your own little anchorage, your own beat. You could go to a town if you wanted to or not um and yeah we just love it because we can explore at our own pace and uh be outside really yeah and not to mention uh phenomenal weather this like in like you know we're yeah. We're, it's a great time to head south in the in the winter, and you guys are you guys. I mean, is it is it as good as one might think? Yeah, um, it's in the seventies, so yeah. we came a little bit earlier this year, so it's definitely been more stronger. I guess storm systems have been moving through this year, um, but it's still been like I think the lowest is in like sixty seven or something. Wow. Um, and then it'll get up to the eighties. It was in the eighties last year when we got back kind of around April, but yeah, my sister, my sister sent a picture and they were bundled up in their winter coats because they're in Philadelphia. And I was like, Oh, I kind of forgot that it was winter. And you guys were <laughs> everything. And it was You're like, sorry, I was down catching <laughs> lobsters and spearfishing. Yeah, I, I literally I forgot. That. I love it. What are the, you mentioned like go to a town or something. So I've been to Nassau and, and some of the islands in the Caribbean like the Caymans and and things like this, mm -hmm. but I'm I'm envisioning these are a bit more like rustic. When you say a town, and like like what's the lifestyle like on these on these islands? Totally varies. Where we are now in Spanish Wells, it's I would say one of the more established ones. So um, that's why we have uh, some family flying in to the North Olympic. Luther Airport because they have the airport nearby. They have a taxi service set up. They have a pretty nice grocery store. But yeah, very, I don't know, island vibe. I don't, there's yeah. probably four restaurants, four or five restaurants. And like, this one's like pretty good. You can rent golf carts and re like kind of take them around the whole island if you want to. And they've got a bunch of rentals and stuff like that. But when you get down into the Exumas, it's really small. So they might have maybe you'd probably we'd probably like dingy to shore and it'd just be like one street and we could walk up and down the street through the main town in like 10 minutes you know and pretty yeah. much just just very residential and maybe one little restaurant and one one store um convenience store type thing yeah so this is a pretty like i guess what you could say built up area in the abacos like hope town that's a pretty um well-established area even after the hurricane they've they've um made a lot of progress there a lot of people go there i'd say um to, to rent a house and stuff like that whereas in the exumas i think you'd have to be a little bit more which island specifically you would go to to find the, the vibe you were going for you know if they had any amenities and stuff like that um and some of the islands we go to have literally nothing on them it's just an island and some of them stay private and some of them don't but there's nothing on them. That's yeah. amazing that those <laughs> exist. Like you're you're so close to civilization and there's just these like yeah. uninhabited gorgeous islands that that are untouched. I mean, it's incredible to think. Yeah, we we ride up to them and we're like, you know, somebody must own this. You know, like but like who? And like did they have any plans for it? Or you know, some of them will have like some building, like a little bit, like somebody started to build something on it, but then it just ended. And so we always are kind of discussing what could have been or what the dream was or maybe not you know i don't know maybe they just wanted a little campsite so 
Yeah. Think about this too, actually. We were joking before, like uh, when we were setting this up, like, you know, we, we've got a camper van and we drive around a lot and see some different corners of the country or the continent that maybe you wouldn't see on the normal tourist track. And, and, and we think that all the time. You see these like gorgeous little, like beautiful little villages or, or little seaside towns or something or something that obviously it used to be this beautiful place and it's like kind of nothing now. And, and you're just like, how is it this way? You know, like how, how yeah. is it not something? because it's such a great location for for something to be here. (laughs) But then you're like thankful that it's not. Yeah. And for us, we're like, well, I guess how would anybody get here? You know, like we came here on our boat, but where is like, how would anybody, the system that would have to be set up so that somebody could enjoy this like we currently are. Yeah. I we need know. to do like a uh, like a swap here. We need to get you guys come over to Europe and take the camper van and just go and we'll come down there and enjoy the Caribbean. Yeah. And no, really, um, can we do that? Can yeah. we do that, please? Because uh, three months isn't enough time to like do both of these. So yeah, I randomly search for virtual jobs. I just like haven't fully committed to it. It's a different mindset, you know, traveling and working versus traveling on like vacation mode. So totally, you're putting the exploration a little bit on hold but you know for the long term that would be fine it's just a different mindset yeah we're, we're all adjusting well that sounds like a good plan to me and actually it brings <laughs> yeah. me to something that you said earlier that i wanted to ask you about so like you said you know we weren't sailors and we we took a sailing course so i'm envisioning <laughs> actually like i have been envisioning leading up to this conversation that you guys were like lifetime lifetime boaters and that you worked your way up to this big catamaran over years and that jonathan was just like all already a, you know, a, a, a captain no. of some sort. It sounds like that was not the case. No, that was, that was the opposite. Yes. <laughs> we've grown up, grown up around the water and we like boating on like little motorboats and going to the sandbar and walking and stuff. But Jonathan had learned to sail on a styrofoam sailboat on the lake with his dad in the summer, you know, but that was it. That was, that was the sailing experience to the max. So we were trying to be smart. And we signed up to take the sailing school. So we like could just feel like we knew what we were doing, like how to raise the sail, for example. And so yeah, we took the sailing school. It was, we ended up doing it out of Charleston. We were gonna do one out of Miami, but uh because of it was basically right when COVID started, so it got canceled. But it all worked out because we ended up buying our boat and then taking the sailing school. And it was awesome because we learned to sail our boat and awesome. our boat versus taking on just a chart. A, a charter boat, basically. No, we didn't. We had no sailing background whatsoever. So, but it it all worked out. It we ended up doing the sailing school on our boat, and the instructor was awesome and kind of went through you know specifics on this boat versus you know just a basic catamaran that they would have used at the school. Um, it all worked out. Um, but you know, after that, you just have to do it. So I've been really, I've told Jonathan over and over again that I'm really proud of him for just actually taking the time to pull the sails up every chance we can because we have two engines like we could just motor right along you know and sometimes we have to like the weather literally runs everything but he you know we'll leave at midnight to do a crossing and by 1208 the sails are up and if nothing else we're motor sailing so sometimes we'll, we'll motor sail if we'll just do like one engine and the sails just so we're you know still we're getting a little bit more speed but um we're not putting necessarily putting a lot of hours on the engines and um, we're able to utilize the sails as much as we can yeah he's been really great about you know initiating sailing at all times so i've been really happy about that i i've been trying to do a little better but the th- it's funny yeah. the things you learn and that become like normal like I, w- I wouldn't even think about that you know but like once you <laughs> yeah. you just dip your toe in this world a little bit and you're like you start learning all these things it's it's the same in a different way with a camper van like all these little things that you like have to do you're constantly refilling yeah. water dumping water yeah. update you know like there's all these little things you end up doing even from like dismantling a table to putting the table back up at certain times when you're driving oh. not driving there's Lots of little things. And it just becomes a little bit second nature, which is kind of cool. Like for, for you guys to go from like, you know, two years ago, having never done this to to now being talking about like, yeah, you know, not putting too much wear and tear on the motors. And we do say we do sail sailing. And yeah. I don't know, it's it's cool how commonplace it can get really quickly. Yeah. And, you know, you think, oh, um, yeah, we're handy. Like Jonathan's handy. He can fix like so many things. Like he's good with cars and house. Okay. The boat systems are not the same. Like so that was yeah, it was it was another learning curve, and, and every boat system 
is different. So just because this is the manual for this product, that does not mean that is how it's going to work. Um, right. So <laughs> because whoever owned your boat before has set it up in some weird convoluted way. So um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's been good though. It, it def- I'm glad that we just left. Um, a lot of people say it's easy to get stuck at the do- at a dock. Um, and I could see why they say that. Um, there's always going to be projects. There's always going to be things to make better and to improve and, you know, better weather to wait for. But you just have to leave and kind of figure it out as you go. And because you would, you, people do just get stuck at the dock and they, they don't end up traveling that much. So, There's a million reasons not okay. to leave and there always will be yeah. like, like, and that's, that can be attached to all these things we're talking about. Like when you think about leaving your job to go sailing in the Caribbean, like you could be like, well, I got that raise coming up or that, that promotion's yeah. just one year away. Or like, if we save for two more years, we'll have this much. And there's going to mm-hmm. always be be that and and when you get to those two years later, there will be another landmark on the horizon that you'll want to get to, and so you do. You just have to sail away and just like just do it. Yeah, it's uh, you definitely have to just do it. It's, there's always gonna be something. Even when we talk about like, okay, well maybe we'll keep going this year. Like maybe we could just keep going. Like don't go home. We could just go to the you know Virgin Islands or the Dominican Republic and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Or we could go home and we could do it next year. You know, but it's always there's never gonna be this like okay now we're ready you know i think it's always going to be something there's going to be a little hesitation and you know something going on do do you have aspirations to go like like is there a kind of a goal i guess maybe for lack of a better term but like do you want to see all the islands in the caribbean or do you have aspirations to sail to south america or like like what's the general concept i think we've we definitely want to go further than the Bahamas. Um, I think last year we considered our learning year. This year we're having a lot of people come visit um, family and friends. So we kind of, we definitely made a little bit of that decision based on we kind of know these waters and we know like some things we definitely want to show people around here. But we, we would love to, there's a kind of a path or route where you go down towards the Dominican and through the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And um, a lot of people go to Grenada for hurricane season and then keep going after that like to Martinique and I mean I would love to do all of that for sure we have no aspirations to cross the Pacific um I do not want to be on the boat for 20 something days just seeing only water like I have zero aspirations <laughs> to do that trip but yes we would love to do more islands in the Caribbean lifestyle um but very cool. Yeah. We're going to, we'll wrap it up here soon. I have like about, I just have like 37 more questions I want to ask. So I'm going to try yeah. to narrow them down to like three really quick and we'll just do okay. not rapid I'll fire, but we're going to move through them. So you mentioned the the sailing school just real quick. Okay. If somebody's interested in doing that. What, what, is, what are we looking at in terms of like timeline, cost, investment um, uh, overall? So the ones we looked into where you could do a week, just a week straight, and you could get, I think that was for four different sailing classes. So four sailing certificates. It was like 101 through 104, I think, something like that. And it was like learn to sail basics through Catamaran Lake. And that was, you could do like a week or the one we did, they broke it up and we did it over, um, we did two weekends. And then we actually, the last part was they helped us move the boat from Charleston to Hilton Head because part of the class was go out and do like a little trip. So they were awesome and we, it was useful. You know, we needed to get to Hilton Head anyway. And so we needed yeah. part of the class. And it was, it was, again, awesome. A couple options, I guess, as far as like what you're do, a lot of people do them in Miami, but you can also do them. Some people go to like Aruba and do the class there just because then you're literally on a one week vacation also learning, but you're staying on the boat for that week. So. Not terrible. Uh, that that sounds good. I think I the cost out of my brain. Yeah. Is it like hundreds or, or thousands or tens of thousands? I mean, I, no, I have zero clue. Thousands. Thousands. Yeah, like four. So it's a good, good rough estimate just to kind of have in mind. It depends on what classes you're taking, what, what certifications you're going for. Um, cool. But yes, those were the four classes for two people. You oh. don't need it. Like we did that because we we're trying to learn. But you don't, it's not like you have to have these certifications. To, to I see. It. Okay. You also, you also don't have to have your captain's license either. So there, we could go on and on about this. But anyways, you don't have to have your captain's license. You don't have to have these certifications. But it does look good when you're going on to find boat insurance, also a different topic, not today, to be able to put some of these things on there. Okay. 
All right. That's good to yeah. know. I would have, I would have thought you had to have yeah. those things. So that's, that's good to know. You don't have to, yeah. but I would imagine it's kind of a good thing to know. I would say. Yeah. Who <laughs> felt good that we had it? We I'm sure it's coming yeah. handy. We're going to, we're going to get to in a second. I have a question that I want to okay. ask you, which, which maybe it'll attach back to that. I'm also curious on, on another like practical level overall, um, not to get too personal or into your like finances or anything, but just like, do you feel like you had to make like major long term financial sacrifices or like, like all in all, you're, are you guys much further behind from where you were before? Actually turned out much further ahead. And as some context, like I know some people that have like switched to like RV life, for instance, and they spend, they live in the RV and their expenses are way lower, but they end up spending a lot more. They're not working as much. So they make less. So it's like it all, but it all kind of evens out to about even. How, where do you guys feel like you are compared to a couple of years ago? If anything, we've broken even. We've, we sold a lot of stuff. And I think that kind of helped. Um, basically, we sold a lot of stuff, but then we, I think, thought we would save some of it, but it's actually just gone into boat projects. Yeah. Everyone always say boat, so it's just the money in it. Um, but, you know, it's how comfortable do you want to be? How much power do you want to have on your boat? Like, do we have to do some of these things that we've done? No, but we have yeah. because we want to enjoy the boat. Like, if we're not going to do this lifestyle forever, we want to do it. Um, so I think we've splurged a little bit on some things um that we think we are going to do but it's been worth it i wouldn't say i feel like we're broke by any means i think that we've we've worked enough to go and do this again and i think we figured out a good amount of ways to save money like we definitely we definitely like, bought too much in the Bahamas last year like we just we went and got a drink and why are we going we can just get a beer on the boat we don't need to go to this little place it's the beer that's three times too much. You know, bomb is the food and drinks are expensive here. Definitely cut back this year on things like that. I'd say we're we're good, but we're definitely not gaining. We're just kind of maintaining. And that's okay right now. Yeah. Because right? we don't have a bunch of extra things going on at home. Like and, we don't have and I would say you you added I mean if you look at it on like a balance sheet, I mean you added spending three months in the Bahamas. Like like that's yeah, that, right? that has some value, man. It's like the that's work-life uh, balance that counts. here. <laughs> Yeah, there's yeah, you, you uh, can't expect that, to be gaining doing this. Like, it's, no, like, I, I think the, the, <laughs> the amazing part about that is that you can break even and spend three months a year in the, sailing around the Bahamas. Like, even if you come close to that, you're, you're crushing it. So, yeah. that's amazing. Okay. So, then my last question, then I'll let you go enjoy the beautiful sunshine that I see in the background and I'm okay. very jealous of that's- is have you guys gotten into any interesting, hairy situations during this time out on the water, or is it just all Instagram photos and, and catching lobsters and sunbathing? So, I think that we've done a really good job. Like, well, you have to look at, literally constantly look at the weather. Like, everyone said, oh, the weather is going to dictate everything. It literally dictates everything, every <laughs> single thing. If it, and it's not even the rain. It's like it's the wind and the wind direction and what time of the day it's going to switch the direct the wind direction is going to switch and if you're in a horrible location and stuff like that so oh no we've done really great so earlier i kind of mentioned that our plan was to go back to hilton head and to live on the boat and to work. but we were when we were coming back we had got we had crossed back from the, the bahamas to florida and the weather came on a lot faster than it was supposed to and it somewhere we were supposed to get in at like seven at night we got in at 1 1 a.m and instead of high, just low tide, and we were coming into an inlet we'd never been into and this is i guess our worst situation but all in all like fine so anyways we were coming in there's a lot of shifting sand. It was marked all over the charts. We knew about it. We were going basically zero, but the current was super strong. So we ended up hitting a sandbar, just a sandbar though. And we kind of just like skidded onto the sandbar and we tried to reverse off. Long story short, we bent our rudder, which could have been horrible. We could have had a hole in the bottom of our boat and we didn't take in water, but we didn't. We had a bent rudder. We ended up Assessing in our tired state at 1 a.m., we had done two 18 hour days on getting back to the state. And we decided, okay, let's just anchor right right around here, just anchor the boat, and then we'll figure it out. So um, in the morning, we, we used our GoPro second in the water because the current was still so strong. Um, and we assessed that we could still turn the rudder so we can turn the boat using the steering wheel without like gouging the bottom of our boat. So it wasn't so bent that it was wreaking more havoc on the boat. So we decided we were going to take the boat 
the 10 hours up the intercoastal waterway to St. Augustine. The boat hauled out and fit. So that's what we did. That was the worst, I guess. We've played our weather pretty good. We've, I mean, we saw 45 knots the other night, but we were hidden behind this little island. So, you know, we're okay. We've learned to trust our anchor. We've, a lot of people drag if you don't set your anchor right, but we've been really fortunate. And yeah. A lot of a lot of stuff we're kind of constantly checking, but um, yeah, we made it to St. Augustine last year and we got the boat hauled out and we got it fixed. And um, so that was an unexpected plan and or an unexpected part of our plan last year. So we when we came, we stayed at my parents' guest house for a couple of months where we got the boat fixed. But um, yeah, so that was the worst. Not um, terrible. Not not too no. terrible. That's that's. I mean, that, no. but that's that'd be pretty scary, like hitting a sandbar uh, and like like I'm sure there was some very intense panic at that moment. Yeah. It was okay. Let's reverse. Oh, it's like okay, we can sit on the sandbar and wait for the tide to come back up. But what if there's another one? You know, yeah. we can reverse <laughs> off. But then it's like because the current was doing whatever it was doing the direction it pushed us when we reversed off, bent it. But you know, when we talked to the people at the Marine Center, they actually said that our winter weather is in our boat. It actually does at least have some extra support. So it's some some boats apparently don't have. A support so it literally is pretty easy to crack the bottom of the boat when something like that happens so we were very thankful uh that all that worked out <laughs> and but yeah super it's, uh, cool it's i'm yeah. glad it's i'm glad that's the worst worst case scenario so far yeah um, it could have been could have been worse but that also saint augustine by the way one of my favorite like little hidden gems in in the u.s oh, yeah. i love that place yeah we uh we came to appreciate it more and more and we decided that this isn't so bad we were just living our our work weekday life in bluffton hilton head area and we were living our weekend uh work on the boat enjoy St. Augustine life on the weekend. So it was, no. uh, we, we, we made it work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually I'm remembering. So I spent several months living in St. Augustine. At one point I was oh. like traveling around a lot and I would spend, um, my wife and I, Allison and Coda, we spent a month, uh, several times in St. Augustine and oh. I would, we would always meet these people out and about. Like, it's a very, like, you know, this, but anybody listening might not like, there's a very kind of fun little downtown area of lots of restaurants yeah. and bars and people out and live music and would always meet people who were sailing down the intercoastal waterway and like, just had put it like dropped anchor ported. What do you say? I don't know. Ported stopped anchored <laughs> we anchored yeah they anchored anchored yeah. yeah okay so they'd anchored and they'd come in and they'd be like just spending the day in saint augustine and i was yeah. always like these people are the coolest people they're just sailing around they'd be heading down to the caribbean <laughs> and now i've had one of them on my podcast which which is super cool uh, so um, and we're gonna switch lives one day we're, we're gonna do your van life and you guys can come do the boat life and yeah, I think that's I, I'm, win. I'm digging this. I'm a big fan of home exchanges. Uh, we do home exchange and this is like all taking home exchange to a whole nother level when you're like trading camper vans and catamarans. This is, yeah. this is the next level that we're going to. So I can't wait for this. Maybe I'll you feel, find somewhere over there to just, you know, kind of understand the concept of the sailing real quick. A 101 class. I've heard, uh, what Croatia is a pretty awesome sailing. It is. Boating yeah. world. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, that's uh that's supposed to be amazing in the Greek Isles as well. Uh is like some people go do just doing the Greek yeah. Isles. That sounds amazing. So yeah, there's there's a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh Claire, this this was awesome. I'm so glad we got a chance yeah. to catch up. I really appreciate you taking some time to uh come out of the sun and give us a tour of your life. It looks it looks amazing. Yes. And this was this is a lot of fun. Yes, thank you so much. It's been great. <laughs> great. Well, uh, enjoy the weather there. Uh the rest of us will be jealous watching from a distance and we'll we'll catch up again soon sounds good have a good day thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world once again i'm chase and this has been another episode of about abroad for those of you wondering how you can best support the show i have made it super simple for you just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter, no spam, guaranteed, or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me, it also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice, and we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.